Hello, Paul. Welcome back to the Wax Museum. You're my first guest in like two months. And you were my last guest. I was going to ask, was I the last guest? <laughs> yeah. Oh. I just, I got really busy with work and stuff. And then when I was home, I wanted to be home. So I'm like, okay, let's do a podcast now. Yeah. That makes so sense. glad to have you back. Um, I know this was a topic you really wanted to talk about, minimalism. Yeah, I'm very interested. I'm very invested as well as interested in minimalism. Yeah, so so why is that? Why are you fixated with minimalism right now? Um, I think we live in a culture and a context that is constantly and consistently um, inundated with different apps and programs and clubs and gatherings and like read this book, listen to this podcast, watch this show, um, you gotta listen to this album, like all those different things. And I like all of those things. I just think, um, you know, where we live in the Western world, you're in Canada, I'm in the United States. It just feels like we have a mentality of more, 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 more will make me happy. Like this isn't fulfilling me. So this next thing will. And I learned from some people that God placed in my life, like, no, I think those people are a lot happier and they have a lot less. Mm. Not because they have to have a lot less because they chose to have a lot less. And then once, once I realized that, I was like, oh, this is like a secret. It's like unlocking like a secret. And then life is just more simple. And you don't care about money as much. You don't care about having the new, like, like an iPhone would be a good example. Like you, there, mo most people, not, all, not everyone, but most people that use iPhones are like, oh, when the new generation comes out, I got to go stay in line or I got to get it ordered to my house or whatever. And even the people that aren't like that are like, within, you know, I'll get it within six, eight months. But you don't need mm -hmm. to. You can keep the same iPhone for like years before you yeah. switch. And it still does all the same things. Interesting. Yeah. Well, and I, I think a lot about like busyness and how like when we clutter our lives, there's a certain level of busyness we get to as well. And mm -hmm. I was just listening to a podcast where they were talking about happiness. And they said that idleness is required for happiness, which is like, I've never really thought too much about that, but it's like, if you have a certain amount of idle time, you feel like you're not too busy. Even if you trick your brain into thinking that you have some idle time when maybe you are really busy, but you give yourself breaks and you give yourself idle time, that helps yeah. a lot with your mental health. Absolutely, like rest is important. That's another thing our culture doesn't doesn't seem to value and rest and Sabbath and all of these things. Uh, we, we need it. And exactly as you said, I'm super busy. I have lots of different projects and different, I wear many different hats. I'm, I have like several different things going on right now. Um, I'm involved in like several different organizations and NGOs, but as you said, you can trick your brain and just be like, today is a rest day. Yeah. And it really doesn't, it actually makes you more productive. It's like, I got to do 300 things. Well, I better just take a day to myself and just listen to music and go downtown, like eat at a nice restaurant and go see. I like to see movies alone, things like that. Like just do, just have a, have a day where, you, where you're not constantly interrupted by all the many different things and text alerts and push notifications and all those things. And you, your list will stay the same, but the next day you will feel well rested and you'll be more productive rather than trying to do it all and not resting and then burning out. Yeah. I mean, I know one of the things I've been doing with rest is like, I have to walk the dog every day at lunch. And so yeah. I do that, but I do it without plugging myself in. Normally, if I have any kind of menial task, I'll be listening to a podcast or music or something like that. And mm -hmm. now I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to walk my dog in the silence. And mm -hmm. I think one of the other things too, I, I was, I was reading a book. I can't remember what book it was, but they were talking about green spaces and how vital it is 
for humans to go to green spaces. Like it's actually has like a very important effect on our mental health to get away from concrete. It's yeah. like, and, and you know, like whatever building materials you have in your house, but it's like to sure. actually see green actually helps you. Yeah. Um, so that, I know one of the, of I know one of the big parts of your practice is digital minimalism. Can you tell me a little bit about that, how that happened and how that helped? Sure. Yeah. Um, I was never too big into like the digital space because I know, I know myself and I know my limits and I was like, eh, Facebook and Twitter is enough. Like I never had an Instagram or I, I think I like tried Instagram and Snapchat at one point. Like this is like a long time ago. I don't even think Snapchat's relevant anymore. But at the time, in like 20, 2013, 2014-ish, when it was really big and people were using it a lot. To, and especially, you know, I'm in the I'm in the creative space, like a musician, stand-up comedian, and storytellers. Like they're like, oh, you should like Snap Stories. You'd be so good at them. You're so funny. It'd be really good. And and I like I played around with a little. I remember my friend Justin, who's a filmmaker. I used like I ran his snap story for a day and he said, I've got more views than when I've ever done it. Like you have to start it and you're gonna follow me and this and this. And I was like, Yeah, I don't want to do that. Like I would just live on my phone. I know that I know myself and I know that I would just be constantly looking for that like that endorphin rush of when somebody like likes it or messages you about it or whatever. But I got really into Twitter, um, especially when I was working in the film industry. Um I was meeting people and working on some bigger things. I did a, I did a, a show for, you know, I did a movie for Universal Studios and then I did a television show for TBS and was starting to meet celebrities and then producers and different people. And I was never, I never really cared if I had like a thousand followers or 10,000 or whatever. Like people are always talking about growing their follower account. I was like, who cares? I'm going to put the same thing up. But I got obsessed with like, oh, okay, good. Now so and so is following me. So that's good. Like the more blue check mark people that followed me, I felt more important, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I was starting to see how unhealthy that was. Um, and then just how unhealthy social media is in general. I was like, what is this? Like, what is this for? Like, is this for me or is this for like to show people like I'm important? Look what I'm doing. Like I went on this kick ass vacation or I did this really cool thing at job or I did this really cool thing at work and like, I have a really cool job and like, I'm better than you. <laughs> like, it's just a weird, I just started kind of becoming disenfranchised with the whole thing, but I was also going through a really bad breakup. I was engaged at this time. This would have been fall of 20. I broke up with this girl in uh, July of 2017. And uh, by spring of 2018, I was still kind of getting over it. I did the classic thing of like, got over her rebounded with someone else and it just kind of went crazy for a few months and then I started the start of the new year 2018 I started getting kind of healthier and I quit dating for a while I was just single and trying to learn to be happy with myself and I got I got into work which was the film industry at the time got really heavy into that and I was getting healthier and I was in therapy therapy was a big part of it and my therapist said I was using Facebook and Twitter mostly Twitter to vent and a lot of it was I was doing stand-up a lot at this time so I was like kind of trying out jokes on Twitter. And then if I got a good response, like maybe I can riff about this on stage. So a lot of it was funny, but I was also like probably oversharing. Um, and like my ex-girlfriend can read my Twitter or my ex-fiance or whatever. And that probably was, that was probably insensitive uh, looking back. But at the time it felt therapeutic and cathartic. Um, so all this is happening and my therapist is like, maybe you should like just take a break for like 30 days. Cause I was talking about a lot of stuff and I think vulnerability is good. I think vulnerable, vulnerability, vulnerable, vulnerability, vulnerability is lacking in our culture. Yeah. Um, but, but I think sometimes when you use social media and people think you're being vulnerable, you just, at least for me, it's just like, well, I understood the algorithms and I understood like people are talking in this way. So I'll talk in this way. Mm. Um, I didn't do that purposely. Um, per, like it wasn't, it wasn't on purpose. It was subconsciously. But looking back, it's like, that's not a help. That's not actual vulnerability. That's not actual. That's just like, you're being a, you're, it's almost like it's performance art or something. As mm -hmm. an artist and as a creative, it's like, I was just using the system to my advantage. And I was like, oh, like, cause you, you know, as like a musician or a standard comedian, like if I'm more personal, it'll have a long, like, it'll make more of a connection. 
because people don't like to talk about their shit. So I just wear my shit on my sleeve, like I wear my heart on my sleeve and wear uh, my mask out there for everyone to see. But that in and of itself becomes becomes its own sort of firewall of, yeah, see, all of you people know me and then use that as a scapegoat so you don't actually have to be vulnerable with real people in your life. Um, Dang. And so, yeah. And you know what? It's funny because like even in person, I've been like that. You know, yeah, people are like, sure. you know what I really like about you is how real you are with people. And I think about yeah. it, I'm like, I'm not that real. I'm just real enough for you guys to feel like you can be real. Yeah. And also those of <laughs> us who are right. And those of us who value authenticity, oftentimes we are, we are living, uh, there's an NF lyric, the rapper NF has a lyric, uh, a lot of people know me, but not a lot know me well. And mm. like artists are like that. We're like, yeah, a lot of people know me but nobody mm. knows me well. <laughs> and then, yeah. Cause I, I, I find for me, it's like vulnerability. That, like I try to be no, it's try to, terrified because they're like, what is wrong with you? people? Sorry. We're a little mixed up here. Uh, I think there's a delay. Is there yeah. A delay? There's definitely a delay. Yeah. Sorry. I'll have to edit that. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I, I find that like, I, I always kind of at least convince myself that I have the best of intentions in everything I do. And so I always think of vulnerability as a way and it is performative, but it's performative so that it'll open up kind of the space for other people to be vulnerable. Right. Yeah. But that vulnerability isn't quite as deep as people would think because there's just things I can't share with people. Right. And so, but as far as like being vulnerable on social media, that's, that's a, that's a tough thing, right? Like to think like, should I be doing this? Is this helpful? Is this going to help anyone? Yeah. And so I just was like, okay, well, you know, my therapist, I'll just see, I'll see if this works. Um, I'll see if he's right. And I deleted all of my social media, uh, or no, I, I deactivated it. And I remember the first couple of weeks feeling angry a lot because people would be like, oh, this, this pop-up show in Midtown was amazing, blah, 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 blah. And I'd be like, oh, I wouldn't have gone to that. I would have stayed at home and I read a book. And then after like, after I did like a month, like around week four or five, I was like, oh, I stayed home and read a book. Like it was a good night. Like I don't have to always be mm. at every, like FOMO ceased to exist once I realized like whatever I'm doing is what I'm supposed to be doing. Like I don't have to do, as a, as a notoriously uh, buck the system type person, I realized I was breaking script. And so then, I was, then it was easy for me. I was just like, I don't have to look like everybody else lives and this thing's kind of stupid, it's kind of dumb. And like there are good parts of social media, but I have all of that with FaceTime and with, you know, texting. So it's like, I don't need, I have, let me see. I don't even plan to do this, but let's see the apps I have on my phone. Because I get mad anytime someone's like, you have to add this app. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do it. I have version, the Bible app. I have Google Maps. I have Google Docs. I have WhatsApp. So these are my social media, I guess. FaceTime, WhatsApp, Zoom, and Marco Polo. I just recently added Marco Polo specifically for one guy who's one of my close friends who lives in Switzerland and he has a wife and kids and he can never FaceTime. So we had, we can send 10 minute Marco Polo's back and forth. Marco Polo uh, is, is great. I, yeah, I, I, like um, I used it once when I was in kind of this group where we were doing um, kind of this inclusive church community thing. Yeah. Um, I can't remember what it was called, but it was with Kevin Millard. <laughs> and uh, that's how we planned our sessions was we would, we would do Marco Polo's back and forth. And that digital community that you and I used to be a part of that's one of the things that we're discussing doing is like using Marco Polo because it's kind of the same thing. Like um, one of my friends in it is like very busy and he's like, the easiest thing for me to do is to just Marco Polo you a little video and then I'll watch your little video whenever I've got time. Right. It's like, I can be in the car and I can just put it on and listen to the audio and all this stuff. So I'm like, it's like people don't necessarily have time to read. But it, it sounds to me right. too, like when I, when I hear you talking about your lifestyle, because like, as we s- talked about 
in episode 107, which I highly recommend. Um, you've lived the life of like a Forrest Gump. And it's like, you've done so many things. And it seems like you're just always the person that's looking for the next thing to do. And you just, you'll jump at every adventure. And so now that you've removed social media from your life, did it actually give you more space for adventure? Oh, absolutely. I would say I'm more productive with my uh, creative endeavors. Like I'm in the middle of uh, writing my first book right now. I got a book deal and I'm working on that. Um, I, I have a whole album written. It just needs to be recorded with full bands. Like I have the demos and we were, we were going to do it uh, the first week of November. And I literally just sent a text today and said, Hey, I need to rest. I've been on the road too much. I just need to, for the rest of the year, I'm just going to spend time with my girlfriend and her family and my family and not, like holidays are coming up we'll we'll let's reassess in january because i have like a little team of people that's working on it but i'm i bring that up to say like like there's an album there's a book like all the stuff i have coming down the pike for like the spring quarter would not be happening yeah. if i was on facebook all the time or twitter and those are the only two i had like i didn't like i think i tried snapchat and instagram and i was like oh i will not i will never live life like, I would just be on this all the time. I was like, I have enough trouble putting my phone down with Twitter and Facebook. And then once I deleted them and that temptation is not there, you know what I found is that uh, I still want to tweet things because I got really addicted to Twitter. And I got like, I had certain tweets that like, oh, that tweet's viral. It has 10,000 whatever shares or likes or whatever. And that's not even viral. But like, to me, it was. It was like, oh, wow. Like, I'm doing good. And... Uh, I still want to tweet things. I'm like, if I see something like that, that'd be a funny joke. I just text it to a friend <laughs> and then like a friend, I think that will think it's funny and then we'll connect. We'll be like, Oh, we haven't talked in a while. Like let's hang out. And then we get like mm -hmm. lunch that week. And it's like, well, that's way better. Like that's, that's so, way better than like pleasing strangers on the internet. So all your connections are meaningful. Yeah. Connections yeah. are more meaningful. And even like even networking and industry stuff, like, is oh what's because the question's always what's your handle and it's like oh i don't have it i'm not in social media <laughs> and then if people really want to stay in contact with you though well then give me your number i'll text you and they like lock you in right yeah. then and so it's really funny when it's like somebody famous doing that because then you're like this is hilarious like <laughs> all you need to do to have access to like these a-listers is delete all your social media <laughs> like i didn't and that wasn't that wasn't one of the reasons i did it but it's just like this is funny like this makes life better because mm. I don't, I just don't think we're meant to live life on a screen, dude. You mentioned in passing, like the digital community we were a part of. And actually the guy that started that, I'll give him a shout out. I just hang out, I just hang out with him recently. Uh, check out, if anybody's listening to this, check out Joey Simpson's podcast, Pastor with No Answers. He's great. Yeah, he he's great. Started, he started digital space that I think, and for me, for the time when I found it, I had no, because of quarantine and COVID and the stuff I lived through that you can listen you can listen about my life story in episode 107. Um, I was in a place where I wasn't seeing anybody in person. And then that was kind of like a primer for me to get back into the real world. But then, as you remember, there was a point like two or three months in where I was like, hey, guys, I, I just can't do this. Like, this isn't healthy for me. And I just left because <laughs> yeah. it was and it's good. It's not a bad thing. But I just think the world is moving very quickly to the digital age. And then there are people like me that are hanging on to analog. And I think eventually the world's just gonna pass us by. It might not be in our lifetime, it might be the next lifetime, but it might be in our, like it might be like three or four decades from now. I'm just like, I can't do it, I just don't. And then the world will just, even now, like when I go to restaurants, it's like scan this QR code for a menu. And I'm like, the, every time I do it, I did it, uh, I was at a restaurant Sunday night, two nights ago with a friend, Jonah. And I said, it's like the robots are winning, dude. Don't you feel like the robots are winning? Like this sucks, I hate this. Like. <laughs> It's just, everything's becoming more, we think we're becoming more advanced. And I really think, honestly, we're just becoming more dumb. Hmm. We have a, True. we have a mutual friend. Oh, what were you going to say? Sorry. No, no, you're right. We are becoming more dumb. I mean, I, I think it's why there's no, oh my gosh. One of my, one of my managers, um, when I worked, I worked for this corporation for a bit. Um, I was contracted to this corporation and my manager there, he held up his phone. And he basically said, like, this is the depth of our knowledge right now. And he just held up his phone and showed. 
the depth of his phone, right? And I was like, dang, like that totally pegs it. It's like, we don't have any depth of knowledge. We don't have any depth of con connection. And that's, that's yeah. what the digital age is, right? We think it's got depth to it, but it really doesn't. Well, everybody knows everything, but no one's learning anything. Like we, we have all the answers to anything in the world in our pocket at all times, but you didn't learn, you didn't put any work in to learn it. Like for centuries, people had to study, read, write, discover. Now it's just Siri, what is blah, 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 blah. And then it just regurgitates you the answer. It's unearned and knowledge and we don't know how to wield, to wield that. It. Yeah, we don't know how to yeah. wield it. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, you made some very specific clothing purchases to minimize that portion of your life. Um, how has that helped? Uh, good. I just have, um, I actually have more clothes now than when we talked about this a couple months ago. When, what John's referring to is I said, I just got rid of all my clothes. I gave it away to like homeless shelters. And then I just went to Target and I bought like six black t-shirts, six gray t-shirts, um, a pair of blue jeans and a pair of khaki pants and like 10 pairs of socks and 10 pairs of underwear. Um, and then like the knockoff bands from Target. Um, I have graduated now to actual real bands. Look at that, real bands. Mm. Just because I kept buying, I kept wearing, wearing out, I kept wearing out the, the knockoff bands that are like 11 bucks. Uh, I went through yeah, three yeah, pairs yeah. of them with holes in them. And I was like, I, maybe these will last longer. I don't know if they will or not. We'll, we'll see, it's an experiment. But I also think, um, uh, let, let me go back. So I, and then the reason for that was I don't have to, I don't have to think about what I'm wearing. And I had like a black hoodie and a gray hoodie. Um, more recently, I bought a couple of Georgia caps because I mean it's football season, man. We got to rep the red and black. Uh, so I have I have like more stuff now, which I I feel very. Uh, I'm just kidding. I was gonna say I feel very troubled about. I don't. I just uh, you shouldn't. Yeah, that's like my wardrobe. But I did. I, I I'm like a sneakerhead, and I love sneakers. Um, and that's why I did this because I recently. Uh, well, like through various different means and different things, I've come into a lot of money. And I I was like, if I don't put a safeguard, I'm just going to come home with like 20 different pairs of Jordans and be like, I just spent $5,000 yeah. on shoes. Yeah. Like, so I just decided I'm going to, I haven't ordered them yet. I've been saying this for like two weeks. Like my girlfriend my parents, my brother, my friends are like, dude, just buy the shoes. They, they've all been like, just buy the shoes. You keep talking about it. But I, I think I'm going to get a pair of uh, OG Jordan 1 highs, uh, the special edition dark mocha. But I keep just looking at the page on the internet and like, I think I'm going to buy it. <laughs> and I think <laughs> that's going to be my one nice purchase for shoes. Uh, and I probably will. And I might not because it's just whatever. But we, your question was, why did you do this? Yeah, just to because, again, for the same reason, like even when I had social media, I only had Twitter and Facebook and that was intentional because I just have an addictive personality and I know my limits and need to be self-aware. Otherwise, I will, um, I'll just go off the rails <laughs> with anything, with sneakers, with alcohol, with uh, sex, with... Yeah all these things. I just have to be like, no, nope, I can't be in that place or with that person or do that thing. Um, and that, that takes, I think a lot of therapy and it's also ongoing. Like I'm still in therapy now. It doesn't, it's not like, Oh, well I learned it. And then I fixed it. It's like, you just constantly have to be in a state of learning and relearning yourself and also giving yourself grace and also realizing that you like, we all change. Like that's something I'm learning now at 30 is I change. I'm not the same person I was so I was, I was sober for four years. I just started drinking alcohol again in August. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't think everybody has to, that's not prescriptive. But I was like, I think I could, I'll be okay. And so far, by the grace of God, I've been okay. Um, yeah, so I think if you wanna, you know, with, with all these things, do it responsibly. And there are certain things like alcohol, that's an easy one for, like our culture is like, you can either do that responsibly or you can't. Like if you keep getting plastered and you keep, if you keep making yourself a jackass when you drink too much, like you clearly have a problem. But then I think with social media, that's like a culturally accepted one. 
where it's just like, yeah, we all don't know how to do this and we're all abusing it. So it's fine. Yeah. And that's just interesting to me. I'm like, it's kind of the same thing. Like there have been scientific studies that are like, this is bad for you. Like there are, there are whole documentaries made about it. And then we just still keep doing it. And it's I, like, interesting. I feel like most people don't know the effect that social media has on them because they never disconnect from it. Yeah, and but like, they also, those are the same people that watch like the social experiment on Netflix. Was that what that documentary was called? Uh, the, it wasn't social yeah. experiment. The social dilemma. I think that's what it was that's called. That's it. That's it. Yeah. The social dilemma. Those are the same people that watch the social dilemma. Like, this is so bad for you. And then they just keep <laughs> doing it. And I'm like, I, yeah. And I mean, I've made it a regular practice now of disconnecting every Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I disconnect from all socials. I don't listen to podcasts because I podcast. I'm like, I don't even want to think about podcasts. Right. And so I disconnect from all those things. Um, and I stick to like, I'll listen to an audio book if I've got time or I'll sit and read or whatever. Right. But, um, I've been noticing too, like, I think part of like learning self learning is like paying attention to your emotions. And like, I know for me, and I, I did a whole podcast on this podcast 108 was all about this, but it's like, I realized I needed to put bridge on the shelf for a bit like i was like this whole trying to save the world thing i can't do it and so i yeah. just like i just killed bridge for care. like a period of time until mm -hmm. i realized i'm like okay so what can i do right and then i started paying attention to social media a little more again but then i was like okay i'm not clicking on any of these links to these articles i'm not gonna read any of the comments and I realized I felt so much better. Like I felt so much better because I wasn't enraged by all these people that are saying terrible things, you know? And like, that was really getting to me. Yeah. And so then uh, just like yesterday, I made a post on Facebook and there was some kind of, somebody made it all controversial. And I was like, okay, I hate this. I unfriended that person. I deleted the article. And then I'm like, you know what? I'm also going to delete Facebook from my phone. So there's no Facebook on my phone now. And I'm just like, I just didn't like what it was doing to me emotionally. So I just deleted it, right? I was like, I'm done with yeah. it for now, right? And I'm like, I'm not 100% sure if it'll ever go back on my phone. But I don't know. I think you can start reintroducing stuff and see how it feels. And it's like you're saying with alcohol, it's like I'm reintroducing it but I'm going to see how it goes and I need to really monitor how it's affecting me emotionally. And I think that's yeah. so important. And you don't know that until you eliminate it. It's like, it's like one of those elimination sure. diets, right? Sure. You eliminate yeah, yeah. everything and it's like, all right, I'm going to start eating rice or I don't know. I don't know how. Yeah, like I'm not, diets right. Work. That's a, that's a good point. Like I'm not opposed to one day having a Twitter again, but Right now, and I've, I've thought about this. Like I thought about this recently. It was like, I could maybe start Twitter. And I was like, nah. Like it's not, because for me, I just know. <laughs> and I could do it one day, potentially. Like, I don't want to write that off, but it, yeah. it does make you much less productive. Because then every, you spend so much like mental energy on like, what's going to be a funny tweet? What's going to be an attention grabbing tweet? What's going to, like, how can I frame this in a way where it'll start a discussion? Like this idea I have. And instead of, since I don't have a Twitter, I'm like, well, maybe I'll write a book and then I get a book deal. <laughs> it's exactly. like, that seems better. Like, that seems better. So like, I just don't have, I don't have any interest in it right now, but it could be at some point I could see the potential of it or, and people are even starting to talk about like, well, you know, like when the book comes out, you're going to have to get an Instagram. And I'm like, no. And they're like, well, you have to do press. And I'm like, no, like, I don't, I know people that don't. And then, you of even, course, like you could even have an assistant that does Twitter for you. If well, that's what a lot, I have friends who do that. I've talked to them, and I've been like, "How is it?" And they're like, "It's fine." They're like, you know, people will come up to me sometimes and be like, "Thank you for the discussion I had with you about blah blah blah," and I'll just be like, "Oh yeah, it was great." And like that wasn't me. That was someone I hire. I pay, you yeah. know, five hundred bucks a week to just run my DMs. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. That's amazing. Yeah, no. Um, I guess the other thing I was thinking of too is like they talk a lot about how boredom is important for creativity. So when you're constantly connected, 
you're and you're constantly board, yeah. working things. You don't, write, you don't write songs. You don't write stand up. You, you lose write, you your creativity. Yeah. yeah. And I find mm -hmm. that every Sunday I will have a ton of ideas, like things that'll pop to my mind. I'll put them in notes and that'll end up being like a podcast idea, a song yeah. idea or a tweet or whatever. Right? right. And it's just, there's so much benefit to it. And so it's like, we need, we need that boredom and we need that, um, what did I say? Idle time, right? Like those are two things that are so important. And I think minimalism really lends yourself to more of that. Yes, I, I concur. All right. So are there other aspects of minimalism we haven't covered that you practice? Money. Um, I try to give right now I give, um, Hold on, let me do them. I'm bad at math. <laughs> right now I give 80% of my income away. Wow. Um, but I learned that from Shane Claiborne, who gives like, hold on, he gives, hold on, give me one second, I'll figure this out. I have to use my calculator. <laughs> Shane is a guy that I just, I have so much respect for. That guy. He's legit. Really, he is. And I, I really loved to see what he did with Greg Locke and like went to his church and expected to get kicked out, but didn't get kicked out, actually sat down with them and then wrote an article about it. And he was yeah, very we, fair. He's he I, I haven't Delta, read the Delta variant. It's like the Delta variant white nationalism or something like that was what he titled it. I'll, I'll link huh. the article in the show notes, but it was really interesting. Cause he's like, there's a Delta variant form of, I think it's white Christianity, actually a Delta variant form of white Christianity and it's dangerous. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, like that's it. And I know so many people that are kind of brainwashed in the same ways. And I'm like, this is crazy that this is even considered Christianity, but I, I, there's just something about Shane though, that has this, like, he has this level of grace and this level of love and he can say things that are critical like that, but you know, it's coming from a legit place and it isn't Shane trying to throw his weight around or anything like that. He legitimately is concerned about this. Yeah. And I'll say, I haven't read the article yet, but I did talk to him while he was writing it. We actually talked on the phone. He said, I'm about to, um, turn this in he's like you can pray over that because we prayed on the phone i think that day um and i don't i don't talk to him often like maybe once every like two or three months we'll have like a phone call if that it depends it depends the reason we had a phone call is because i was going through something and i needed help and he's a very uh you know he's just the real deal and he will help people that when they need him um but i did say it was i think it was the i think we talked either the thursday or the friday after he went to the church i said hey how'd that go and he said you know what i'm actually about to turn this article in we can pray for that and we prayed over it and then uh yeah he he does care he said yeah madam you know we talked it was cordial uh i'm not going to pull any punches in this article but i'm not i hope that he said i think after meeting him you know we both looked each other in the eyes we both you know we see things in a different way and i'm just i'm just troubled and i told him that like I'm just troubled by what I've seen and things I've heard from you. And I'm not sure it's, it has anything to do with the Bible or the word of God. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't remember to change his exact words. So I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he said something to that effect. I don't want to misquote him, but uh, yeah. But the, the reason I brought him up, he keeps 1% of his income. That's uh, insane. He, he, he and his wife, Katie keep, between 0.5%, they keep between half a percent and 1% of his income. Um, I just had to do the math because I don't think Shane would appreciate me sharing on a public platform. And the only reason I know this is because I asked very invasive questions. I was like, hey man, <laughs> what do you make? Like, how do you- You are like that. I love it. <laughs> well, it's because I was trying to figure out, like I had a lot of money to steward and I was like, I think Shane does it well. And then yeah. when he told me, I was like, holy shit. And then- yeah. He said, he goes, well, I used to keep a lot less, but then I married Katie. I just pictured Shane like living on like $6,000 a year. Like, <laughs> I'm good. I don't need anything else. <laughs> well, that's like the whole bachelor life, right? Like, it's like, I don't need a 
I don't need a coffee table. I, just, I got this cardboard box to put my beer on. Like <laughs> Shane is just really, he's, he just doesn't, I mean, part of it is he lived with mother Teresa for a while in Calcutta yeah. and learned from her. And he yeah. told me a story about how I, I was talking about like the, the, the mega church uh, machine in America. I was like, Hey, what troubles you the most about this? Cause I knew we were troubled about the same thing. They said, I don't know, just, you know, the millions of dollars they use on lights would be one thing. He was like, when I lived with mother Teresa, we would mix ashes with our soap to make the soap last longer. And I was like, that's not like, oh that's my gosh. minimalism. Like, I don't know anything about minimalism. Like talk no. to Shane, he knows minimalism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's but, incredible. Yeah, I, I that's so inspiring. Like, I'm just like, and I mean, there's just something so much healthier about not having all this junk in our lives. Um, so I guess, I don't think we even, I need to even ask this question, but um, it's pretty obvious that minimalism will look different from person to person. Yeah, 100%. Like, and yes, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, and that was one of the things when I was asking Shane these questions, he said, but don't do what I do, like pray and ask God, like what would he have for you? And I think, like, what does the Lord have for me? I think it's the question all of us need to ask. Absolutely. And so for me, uh, that's where I'm at right now. And sometimes I'll have more, sometimes I'll have less. But um, yeah, so I would say like, so we talked about like fashion, clothing. And the, the funny thing is like with fashion, I love fashion. So that's the same thing with sneakers. It's like, well, I love it. I'll get way too into it. And then I'll, I'll be embarrassed of the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars I've spent on my wardrobe. Um, same with social media. Um, I'm not gonna spend money on social media, but I'm just gonna, spend too, I'm gonna invest too much time. Like we're spending, yeah. like we have to look at where are our dollars going? Where's our time going? Where's our energy going? Yeah. And so I think those would be three of the big ones for me is uh, social media, um, clothing and fashion, and then just finances in general. Cause once you detach yourself from your finance, you're like, no, I don't need more. In fact, I already have enough. You life just becomes happier. You get to be more generous with your money. You get to give it more freely. You get to tip white staff better. And it's, you just feel better. Like you feel better, not like, not in a conceited way of like, look, I'm, I'm tipping hundred percent to this waiter. Like not like, not in that way. And in the way of, oh, I'm not, I don't need this stuff. I, I used to think I needed it. I don't need it. Mm. And I think that, you know, for me, I'm a born again believer. So when Jesus said, you can't serve two masters. You must either hate one and love the other. Like you must serve one and not the other. You cannot serve God and money. I think it's really interesting. He chose money. He could chose anything. He could have said sin. He could have said sex. He could have said uh, all sorts of things. And he chose money because we all live in a way where we worship money. Yeah. And, and I'm not even free from that. Like I still tend to worship it in a different way. I used to worship it in a way of I need more of it. Now I worship it in a way of I need less of it. And that's, uh, that's still putting the wrong emphasis. <laughs> that's interesting. Um, I've never thought yeah. of that. But you're like, I, I know that that is something they say about billionaires, like these crazy, like billionaires, they're like, they don't know how to get rid of their money. Yeah, right. And I'm like, that's a problem. I think anybody would be like, Oh, I wish I had that problem. But it's like, no, I, I I can see that being a problem too. I will say this. The, the happiest I've been in my life is when I'm a tortured artist and I'm like living paycheck to paycheck because I was doing what I wanted to do and it didn't matter the money I had. You guys want to meet a really cool cat? Oh, oh she ran away. Bindi, <laughs> come here. Bindi. Bindi. I'm so are there... Friend. Friend's house in Chicago. This cat's awesome. What were we saying? What was your question? Are there any resources on minimalism then that you would recommend other than texting or calling Shane Claiborne? That's what I was going to say. Was gonna say just, email, <laughs> just email Shane Claiborne. Like, here's, here's Bindi. Yes. Oh, she's beautiful. Yeah. She's so sweet. For the audio portion of the podcast, this is a black cat. Oh, yeah. And she's, yeah. Yeah, I stayed here recently and there was a moth in the house and she just sat, she watched it go up a wall and like land above a door and she just sat there and went, meow, 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 meow. 
she, did you hear? She's a barn cat. So she, and then like, I, I went and picked her up and tried to help her get it. And then it flew away. And then two hours later, she was sitting in the same spot. And, going, no, 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 no. and I was like, it's not there anymore. And I picked her up and she, she looked around and then she swatted the wall. And then she looked at me, like told you. And then I put her down and she opened her hand and she had them off and she ate it. <laughs> but like, it was like, she understood. I was like, it's not there. And she's like, no, no, no. And when she swat it, she turned around and looked at me and then went back to looking at it and got it with her other paw. I was like, what a cool cat. And now ever <laughs> since then, we bonded and now we're best friends. That's awesome. Love it. Yeah. Um, resources on minimalism. I do not know. <laughs> I don't. I just, it was, these are all just personal decisions I made for myself. And I think it's a combination of many different things I've heard from many different people. Um, one of the biggest influences in my life has been Shane Claiborne. So I would just suggest read anything he's written, uh, The Irresistible Revolution, at least in terms of these subjects. He's written lots of books and co-authored lots of books and they all have to do with different subjects. But The Irresistible Revolution covers this a lot. Okay. Um, and then, excuse me, um, Radical by David Platt, which kind of gets bastardized. And um, I, I met uh, David and I, I, was, I don't know him the same way I know Shane. Like if you asked him, who is Daniel Edgar? He'd be like, I don't know who that is. Um, <laughs> but I think there are some good things in that book. I think people took it the wrong way. Like okay. it, uh, people, like, cause, and I do want to say that before we close. Like, um, yeah, you, when people talk about the prosperity gospel of like more, 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 more. And then we're like, that's not like, pastors don't need private jets. Like that's pretty easy. It'd be like, yeah. that's just, that looks like it doesn't line up with scripture. But poverty gospel would be the other end of that spectrum. And that's what I yeah. meant earlier when I said a lot of people worship money in, in the sense of I need more, I need more, I need more. But you can worship it in a different way of I need less, I need less, I need less. Yeah. You're still not you, – you just need to be – everybody needs to, as you said, live in their own conviction of how much do I need and what do I use it for? Yeah. And every, it's going to vary from person to person. And I think a lot of people read David Platt's Radical and then they were like, okay, I'm going to sell my house, sell all my cars, <laughs> give away all my stuff. And moved to West Africa with no plan, no money, and no umbrella. <laughs> and it's like, okay, that seems like I don't think Jesus would ask most people to do that. Maybe a small <laughs> few, probably not most of us. Um, and so I think people can easily, when it gets to minimalism, especially if it's in the context of if you're talking about believers in the body of Christ, we have we we do a really good job of uh, <laughs> just completely contorting like a good idea. <laughs> And I know I do it and I see so many other people doing it. So that would be my one, my one thing. Like, eh. But resources, yeah, those two books come to mind. Um, I'm awesome. sure there's some podcasts you could listen to. Do you know any good podcasts about minimalism? I have not found any. I haven't looked for any. Um, there's a Netflix show on it too, I think. A Netflix movie on minimalism, which I haven't watched. So that would have been good research yeah. for this. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, I should have. We should have both researched it. Um, That's all good. Yeah, I, I think you're I living think it, man. Is, I think minimalism is very subjective, so it's just yeah. every person, like, yeah. Well, I, I mean, is there anything else you want to say? Um, yeah. Um, wear your mask and wash your hands, and be sure to keep washing your Doritos with Clorox. You remember? <laughs> You remember back when no one understood how COVID worked and like yeah. we were all wearing gloves and masks and all sorts <laughs> of stuff. Like, and we were just like <laughs> every grocery, we would like take it out of the bag and then like put it in a different Ziploc bag and then wash <laughs> that Ziploc bag. Like it was just so great. Like we, it took 45 minutes to just unpack like bread and milk from the grocery store. Um, that's funny. Yeah, I honestly um, never did all that, but uh, yeah, there was. I was thinking a lot about my hands. I'm like, oh, I touched the gas pump. All oh, of I should have touched it with. I should have touched it with gloves, and there was all that. But it, I was glad when that part was over. When all we realized that it's hands. Like, so no one has ever had cleaner hands than all of us that lived through the year 2020. Like no, I think <laughs> in all of history that we had the cleanest hands in everyone who's ever lived through history. Everyone was washing their hands every five seconds. 
yeah. like it was just so weird i gotta say so smooth it's been really interesting living through a world event like that being a hygienist because i'm like seriously looking at the research as it comes out and it's like oh it's airborne you know and yeah and so <laughs> it never lived on surfaces we just lie we just didn't know they didn't lie they they're well, doing, like that's how it does works. like it is on surfaces but it's um it's minimal it's not as big of a minimal. deal as dude, a respiratory dude, spread full circle man minimal they're minimalists COVID. COVID is the minimalist of the the uh, the global pandemic. <laughs> of all the global pandemics. Of all the global pandemics, <laughs> COVID is the minimalist. All right. Okay, so if That's our listeners want to get now. in touch with you, Paul, I'll drop your email in the show notes and we'll go with that. You can text me at 70646, wait, plus one, 706-461-7654. That's my number. You really? can call if you want. Yeah, that's <laughs> sweet. You can call. I probably won't answer, but if you text, I'll answer. All right. Um, that's my number. It goes straight to my iMessage. Well, thank you for coming on, Paul, and we will do this again. We've got many, many topics to talk about. Yeah, man. I always love coming on your show. Thank you for having me. Air smudge.